My name is Heather Finn, and I am a partner at Smart Moves. Um, and for those of you who weren't able to join Alex Cook for the first session, I just want to let you know that SMART stands for Sensory Motor Arousal Regulation Treatment. And today we are going to be talking about the proprioceptive system and its role in somatic regulation. And we're going to be able to have an opportunity to do a little experimental practice, experiential learning together. And one of the things that I want to just emphasize from the very beginning, and I will emphasize it again as we move toward the practice, is that this practice opportunity is invitational only. So I'm going to offer different proprioceptive experiences, and I want to invite you to listen to your body, to tend to your safety, which is a therapist skill that we use in SMART all of the time, and to only do what feels comfortable to you. And I will offer different modifications for you to explore over the duration of this talk today. I am absolutely thrilled to be with you and thank you to the TRF for welcoming us um, and having Smart Moves join uh, the Trauma Tuesdays, TRF Tuesdays. And I am going to begin with our talk today. And again, as I mentioned, um, I'm Heather Finn from uh, Smart Moves LLC, and we're going to be looking at the proprioceptive system and the role of proprioceptive input in somatic regulation. And if you are curious to learn more about SMART and SMART Moves at the end of this talk today, feel free to visit us at our website at www.smartmovespartners.com and you can learn more. So you may recall from Alex's presentation last week that she introduced the SMART regulation map. And the SMART regulation map is one way that we use to help track different shifts in arousal and state. And how I'd love for you all to consider joining and landing into our talk today would be just to find a comfortable place where you are seated, noticing perhaps whatever might be supporting your body, your legs, if there's anything supporting your back and your feet. And I want you just to check in with yourself. What is your energy like right now? Perhaps some of you are joining from, you know, something that you were rushing from, from your workday to get onto this call today. And maybe you're a little frantic, a little frenzied. Perhaps others are at that sleepy time of the day when you really would like a coffee break and you might be a little sleepy or tired. And others may feel exactly in their just right place. You may feel ready to learn, alert, present. However you're feeling right here, right now, just notice. And what I'd like to invite you to do is to take a moment as you're noticing, and you may choose to shut your eyes if that's comfortable for you, or you may choose to avert your gaze to the ground and having a soft, gentle gaze. And just notice, maybe do a body scan from your head down to your toes slowly. Paying attention to any sensations, movements, tensions in your muscles and in your joints. Perhaps a lot of us hold tension in our shoulders. You might just be aware of that tension. And if there's little movements that would help support bringing yourself into a little more of a present moment, engaged state, feel free to 
explore moving our body in any way that feels comfortable to you. Moving down, noticing the muscles in your arms, your abdomen, your quadriceps and your hamstrings. your calves, your feet. And there might be little movements or wiggles, stretching your legs out, stretching out your arms. Whatever your body calls you out to do, feel free to follow that in this moment. with the intention of just exploring what might bring your body into a state of feeling present and here, transitioning into our time together and ready for learning. And perhaps you want to take 10 more seconds or so to complete any types of movements or anything that your body feels like it needs. And we'll come to rest together. Does anyone want to share in the chat? You don't have to, but if you'd like, anything that you experienced or anything you observed or noticed after engaging in this somatic regulation exercise together. I know that I realized in myself, I was, you know, coming on to a presentation, my arousal was a little high and being able to tend to my body, the tension that I was holding in my neck helped me settle down, feeling a little more present. One of our participants notices that her jaw was clenched and she was able to explore opening her mouth broadly and sensing that tension kind of leaving and feeling better. I'm so glad that you're able to tend to that. Other people are becoming more aware of the breath and whether it's deep or shallow. Some folks are aware of a decrease in arousal and a nice yawn, which really can turn on our parasympathetic nervous system. And someone else is noticing that they need some more time to attend, especially after a long, relaxing weekend and transitioning back to work. What an important point as we all are in the state of transition and fluctuation and trying to tend to self. And another person's arousal was high and they held a lot of tension in unfamiliar parts of their body but focusing on it helped bring the arousal down and unwinding. And sometimes we walk around in the day with so much tension that we're holding that we're not aware of it. And taking a moment to just pause, check in, and be aware of the role of our muscles and joints in our somatic regulation can be essential in finding our way to a more integrated present and focused state. And that is going to be the focus of our talk today is we're thinking about the smart um, role of somatic regulation and how proprioceptive input can really be a very safe and effective way to support either up or down regulation depending on what's needed. And For those of you who may not be familiar with SMART or who may also not have had an opportunity to see Alex Cook's introduction talk, SMART basically is an embodied 
trauma treatment that is focused on exploring movement and sensation as an entry point to building capacity for um, allowing children and adolescents. And now we're moving into exploring applications of SMART in adults. But we are exploring for folks impacted by trauma, how do we use movement and sensation as an entry point to better regulation and to support attachment building in families and caregiving systems? And what we've discovered also, although we're not gonna cover it in this talk, is that as kids, families, and adults feel more regulated and more socially engaged and attached, their window of tolerance widens and trauma content bubbles up to the surface and is more available for reworking. And we find that kids, adults, families are able to rework trauma in both somatic ways, engaging proprioception actually, as well as you know, have more access to verbal and other forms, symbolic ways of communicating their experience. And last week, Alex introduced you to this hierarchy of development. And basically the um, primary premise of this and the framework that we use from thinking about this is the way in which human beings develop from the bottom up. From the time we're in utero, we are awash in sensory and movement experiences. Um, children are sucking their thumbs, they're pushing against the amniotic sac and pushing against their mother's belly. We are, children are being able to you know, move around and feel this whole sense of wrapping from the amniotic fluid. Um, and that is engaging their bodies, their joints and their muscles and supporting their own ability to develop, to wire up their brains and as children are born, these sensations, these movement senses are the first ways that we experience regulation outside of the womb, whether it's being swaddled by a caregiver, being held and squeezed, being rocked, being bounced. We are experiencing sensory inputs to support regulation and co-regulation from the moment that we are developing as human beings. And those inputs are essential to move up our developmental ladder to experience more organization in our bodies and experiencing an ability to regulate our feelings and feel more mastery in our environment and to be able to ultimately have a more integrated whole sense of self where our bodies, our emotions, and our thoughts can be integrated and support our desires, our agenda, our needs, and we can be aware of what we need, feel, and want, and communicate that to others. But to be able to do that, we have to have um, functioning and integration at this most bottom level, that green sensory processing foundation. And in this talk today, when I talk about proprioceptive input, that is where I'm focused on, is that bottom level of development um, through our movement senses. And as we're thinking about SMART, there's two important guiding principles that I want to emphasize in this talk. The first is that of sequential development. For those of you um, familiar with Bruce Perry's work, he does a lot of research on the impact of neurosequential development. And that is, is that movement and touch experiences are how we first experiencing calming and organization um, from early childhood. And from there, once we are more organized and feel calmer and safe enough in our bodies, only then can we take in social relationship and um, engagement from another. And then over time, cognitive strategies can be utilized and employed for processing trauma. But first we have to feel safe and well organized in our bodies and movement and touch experiences are able to provide that for folks. The other primary principle that we think about is the idea that all behavior occurs for a reason. And this was the most interesting to me when I first was trained in SMART, that sensory seeking or sensory avoiding is often a way that a child will meet their neurological need. And if we can understand and be curious about 
huh, what is this child's behavior telling us about a sensory need they may be trying to regulate or they may be trying, you know, upregulate for like seeking more of or pushing away, getting less of in order to be able to best regulate their experience, a potentially overwhelming experience. If we can become curious about that, it can really shift the way that we align with and tend to the child's needs to support regulation. And I'll give you an example, and I'll talk about a clinical case further at the end of our talk today. But for example, if a child is running away from adults and running down the hallway, we could see it as a defiant behavior, but we might also think about it as sensory seeking. Perhaps, as we'll learn about today, they might be seeking some more proprioceptive input through their legs. They might also be seeking attachment or connection and running towards something. So if we can engage our curiosity as to, huh, what might this behavior be telling us about a child's sensory and regulatory need, and how can I better understand that, it can really support our um, choices in engaging with a child. And as I mentioned, today we will be thinking about the proprioceptive system. And as you move forward in the weeks um, through the course, we're also going to be looking at the tactile system, the vestibular system, rhythmicity, and then integration of those four into how we tend to attachment and co-regulation. But for today, when we're thinking about the proprioceptive system, the proprioceptive system is actually located in our muscles and our joints. And it is basically proprioceptive receptors reside in those muscles and joints. And they send information from the body up through the nervous system to the brain and give us information about where our body is in relationship to itself. So it supports this idea of body schema, body awareness, and organization, and how I'm able to move through the world in a way that's effective and meets my needs and meets my will and supports a goal. And so as you think about this proprioceptive sense that's experienced through muscles, resistance to the muscles and joints, Let's just experiment with a moment for just making a muscle and just feel the resistance that you might be getting to your muscles and your joints, giving you some information. And now close your eyes and change the position of your body. Now those proprioceptive senses, those receptors in my body are sending a signal to my brain to help me know that my arms are now stretched out straight in front of me and no longer bent at a 90 degree angle at my side. And I don't even have to look. I can just know where my body is in relationship to itself. And that is our proprioceptive sense working for us to know where we're at. And this transforms with development and experience. If you see the image of the little girl here who is working on learning how to walk, she's getting a lot of input through her proprioceptive receptors in her legs, in her arms, and they all have to work together to help her move from a position where it looks like she fell kind of walking around this little puddle to her having to put her hand down, push with her legs and ultimately find her way back into a standing position. And that takes a lot of organization to be able to find your way back from a falling position back on up. And if we think about folks who may be more disembodied, disconnected from their body, experience dissociation, and often don't even recognize they have a body, their arm or their hand may feel disconnected from self, it is really difficult for, for folks who are impacted in that way to be able to effectively navigate their world, know what they're feeling, navigate their environment in a way that feels safe to them. And so engaging in this proprioceptive sense 
can be one essential way to help start to reconnect to the body and learn where the parts of the body is in relationship to one another in relation to the person who is embodying that physical being. And you'll see here in this image is there's so many different ways that we engage our proprioceptive sense throughout the day in normal activities. And one of the greatest parts of the proprioceptive system for somatic regulation is that it's a rather safe and easy input to experiment with and explore. Um, and it tends to be up and down regulating. So if you are really exhausted and tired and you wind up going to the gym, you may feel all of a sudden much more um, alert and awake and active. And if you are really stressed out and you go to the gym and lift weights again, you tend to feel more calm and regulated. And so what we're going to do next is experiment with some different types of proprioceptive activities. And here's a guide. Certainly you don't have to use this as you're exploring, but I'm going to walk you through just a few gentle, moderate, and more intense proprioceptive activities. And I want you just to track in your body and pay attention to what do these activities do for your arousal, for your self-regulation, your somatic regulation, your awareness of self in the world. So the first proprioceptive activity that we're gonna explore together is a very gentle form of proprioception. And you can always just do this at your desk to regulate, you know, during the day with client. And I often work um, with my clients to regulate in this manner. So let's just press our hands together. As hard or as gently as you want, but really feel the muscles engage. Notice what that feels like. And relax. Just taking a moment to notice if you liked or disliked that input, how it impacted your energy and your sense of connection to yourself, your body in the present. The next uh, proprioceptive activity that we're going to do is a little more moderate and we're gonna explore it through our legs. So I want to invite those of you who'd like to try to just notice, plant your feet flat on the floor and start to rise up just a little bit, but hold it, hold it right here. And just feel the input in your hamstrings and your quadriceps as they engage. Perhaps your calves and your stomach muscles are also engaged. And when you're ready, you can come back down. Noticing if you like or dislike that input and why, how it might impact your energy and sense of awareness of self, your body in the present. And the final one, if you're up for it and it feels comfortable, if you're at a chair, you may stand. And I often will use this in between clients as a way to regulate my arousal. And you can just do back of chair push up. And just notice what that feels like in your muscles, your joints, in your body. And taking a moment, just checking back in with yourself. Noticing if there's been any shifts in your arousal. Anything different about the way you're taking in the room or the space in your social engagement system. And we can notice what you may have come up with in the Q&A portion of the chat. I know we're coming close to the end of time. But I wanted to give an opportunity, a brief opportunity to see what proprioceptive opportunities can look like in the smart room. I'm currently in our smart room in our Newton office. And here's some different ways. Kids, we really invite 
following the child's lead and wanting to understand how the child engages in the different tools in this office and what feels good to their bodies. What do they want more of? What do they want less of? And here are some different ways that kids explore proprioception in SMART treatment. talk today by sharing and reconnecting to this idea that all behaviors occur for a reason and the role of thinking about sensory seeking or sensory avoiding as a way of meeting a child's neurological need. And I worked with a young girl, she was about nine years old, and she was referred for SMART treatment. She had been adopted and had experienced tremendous developmental trauma and was engaging in a lot of physical aggression at home. And what I observed in therapy sessions is whenever her family came in and wanted to raise an issue or talk to her about something that they cared about or something that they felt concerned about, particularly anything that was emotion laden, she would engage in a lot of kicking with her feet and her legs and kicking her parents, kicking the wall. And her family also said that she would stomp a lot, kick a lot at home, had kicked holes in the wall. And they would often try to, you know, engage in some timeout um, interventions and strategies to try and settle her body. But what we wound up becoming curious about in the smart room is the role of proprioception through her legs and ways that she may be using that kicking to try to regulate some of the distress she was experiencing uh, as her parents wanted to talk with her about some of their concerns. Um, or talk with her about feelings, is that she would become really aroused and wanted nothing to do with it. And both, it may have been trying to get some distance from them, but I also think it was her way of trying to regulate the internal arousal. And so we started working with proprioception through the legs in the therapy session by Nye inviting her just to notice when she has that kicking energy and to figure out, is there something even in the room that would feel good to kick? And so we had a really big physio ball and invited her to kick it whenever she felt like the need, when she felt really agitated. And over the course, when her parents came into the session and they wanted to address something, we first engaged in a kicking back and forth as they were exploring with me some of their concerns. And over time, she was able to sit down and have her back to the wall and have her dad put his hand around the ball and look at me and talk to me because too much eye contact was overstimulating for her, but allow her to use her legs to provide proprioception against the ball. And that proprioception through her legs and dad's presence and being able to kind of hold her arousal and her distress and being able to hold it for her so she could really get that resistance through her legs and her muscles allowed her to stick with the conversation longer, check more in with herself and her feelings, and be able to stay with things before just blasting out of the room. And that became a transformational moment in our treatment where then the family could bring some of those tools at home when they were feeling overwhelmed and stressed and provide her with opportunities to get proprioception and proprioceptive input through her legs to settle down her arousal so that she could be more um, integrated and tending to maybe more aware of her as her somatic regulation settled, she could be have more room or a wider window of tolerance for her emotions and her thoughts. And 
So I'm just going to let you know if you're interested to learn more, we do have a book available. And here's our contact information. And I know I've run over. I'm sorry about that. I am happy to stick around for any questions and Q&A. And thank you so much for your time. Let's see. Uh, Someone's second. asking, what is the name of the book? Oh, the book, I'm sorry, I somehow I've lost you guys too. Let me see if I can pull you back. The book is called Transforming Trauma in Children and Adolescents and an Embodied Approach to Somatic Regulation, Trauma Processing, and Attachment Building. A very concise name for a book, but <laughs> let's see. I see a question. Thank you. Um, do you suggest doing some of these with all clients with trauma to see if there's an area that needs to be addressed? It's an interesting question. What I will say, um, without going through the, I think doing the whole training would be really helpful to understand all the different therapist skills and the different ideas that go underneath. What we do pay attention to is we do a lot of tracking of the client's body. And if I'm tracking and seeing a lot of um, activation through the legs or through the feet, I may invite a client to try and explore um, proprioception and see what happens in their bodies. Similarly, if I see a client kind of really floppy or disconnected, I may invite some proprioceptive activities such as pushing their hands down, or pushing their feet into the ground, very gentle, small ones, just to see what happens in their bodies and if they feel a little more connected, a little more aware of themselves in the present. Um, but there's a lot of choices and decision-making that goes into if we were to lead and, and invite an intervention like that. Oh, sequential development researcher, Bruce Perry. Um, he did the Norris sequential model of therapeutics. Um, he's through tech, located in Texas. And oftentimes I, I find that um, that's a really nice comprehensive way of assessing children's needs and functioning around the whole uh, domain of uh, different levels of functioning. And SMART can be a really effective way to implement treatment around that. Uh, the neuropsychological model is more of an uh, assessment model and not as much as a treatment model, per se, or intervention model. Uh, the, write down the name of the book. I'm going to try and find I can it. actually go back to that if that's helpful for folks. Any other questions? You're welcome. Did anyone notice in themselves, just a quick question, if there was any shifts in your own arousal, your own regulation when you were able to engage the proprioceptive system. Uh, someone's asking if we could switch to the slide of the triangle diagram. Oh, sure. Let me just. And this recording will be available later tonight for everybody. So um, you can revisit it all then as well. Uh, sorry, I could... There we go. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Great. I'm glad, Allison, that this is feeling beneficial. It sounds like um, some folks felt like they could have used this as a way to support a child who is struggling with dysregulation. Some folks are liking the book. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate everyone's attention and time today.
It was wonderful to be with you all. Next week, we will be, um, well, I will not be with you, but you will be meeting my fellow partner, um, Anne Westat, who will be exploring tactile input and the power of touch in treatment um, with children, adolescents, and adults. And um, so I hope you can come back and join for that. It will be really interesting and really engaging. And thank you all. I'm glad that this talk has been helpful. And um, hopefully we will see you all around. So thank you very much. We look forward to speaking with any of you. If you have questions, you're welcome to reach out to me directly. All right. Thank you, Heather. I'll see you um, next week. Thank you. Bye, everyone.